This is Criminal Behaviorology, a combination of criminology and behavior analysis to assist the criminal and civil justice systems to improve our society in general. A podcast like no other. Here is your host, Timothy Joseph. Hello, hello. I'm happy to be speaking to you again, and we have another podcast that I think is one of the best that we have done so far. I was recently at the ABAI conference in Chicago, and I have the potential now for a lot of great guests. I'll keep you informed. I received a call from Frank Straub, who has, well, he's done just about everything in in law enforcement. He has been a uh, chief of police. He's been a public safety commissioner. He's worked in counterterrorism. And now he is uh, working on uh, understanding mass shootings, particularly school attacks. And he did a comparison study between 51 school attacks averted uh, with 51 school attacks completed. And it is a very interesting study. He called me up because he was interested in actually learning about behavior analysis. And so we got into a conversation and I realized some of the very important work he was doing and how significant it is for what we research right here. So go ahead and I'll go right to the interview. Have a listen. Tell us what you think. Frank, I've... uh looked on your resume and I'm not sure I've interviewed anybody with so much stuff on it. Can you uh, summarize some of your career for us? Sure. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I've had a a great career. Uh, It started in 1984 uh, when I joined the U.S. State Department Bureau of Diplomatic Security. I uh, worked there for for three years. during that three years, I was assigned uh, to the New York City uh, Police Department uh, FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force. Um, worked on uh, kind of terrorism investigations, primarily focused on U.S. and uh, foreign dignitaries, uh, that being uh, threats to them. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> Also spent uh, considerable time traveling the United States and the world with um, U.S. officials and, and foreign officials visiting the U.S. And also spent four months in Bogota, Colombia in 1987, uh, where I was responsible for protecting the ambassador and his wife. Mm-hmm. I got recruited to... Um, joined the Naval Investigative Service, which was then the Naval Investigative Service, now NCIS, uh, as a special agent, primarily to focus on the areas of dignitary protection, uh, force protection, hostage negotiations, Mm -hmm. uh, and crisis response. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were, at that point, contemplating, the Navy was contemplating opening a base on Staten Island. Um, That base got opened in part, it never uh, grew to the size that I think was originally envisioned. And so there was uh, a lot of interest in, in bringing uh, myself and some other folks over to, to help uh, protect that base and, and uh, the personnel assigned to it and assets there. After three years with uh, NCIS, I joined the U.S. State Department. Uh, there I was, uh, excuse me, uh, U.S. Department of Justice, uh, where I worked for the Office of the Inspector General, working primarily on public corruption investigations. And I uh, was there for uh, about uh, nine years um, and then had the opportunity to join the New York City Police Department and to become Deputy Commissioner of Training. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it was kind of an opportunity that one couldn't give up to, to be the deputy commissioner of training for uh, a police organization as large as that one. And so um, 
ironically, on 9-11, I was on my way uh, to police headquarters to hand in my pit work and never made it uh, to, to the uh, one police plaza that day and ended up at the World Trade Center. Uh, oh, really? Involved in, in a rescue, rescue and recovery operation. Okay. Um, so, um, did a year with NYPD and then went up to White Plains, New York, where I was the public safety director for seven and a half years, where I was responsible for police, fire, and EMS. Um, and then out to Indianapolis for three years, um, where I was the public safety director really almost the equivalent of the deputy mayor for public safety, um, had police, fire, EMS, emergency communications, homeland security, uh, animal care and control. And then my last job in law enforcement was as the police chief in Spokane, Washington. And during that um, period of time, that 31 years, um, I was able to get... Uh, I had a bachelor's going into the State Department, but I, I got a master's in forensic psychology and a PhD in, in criminal justice. Um, and then I decided that it was time to retire, and I joined the Police Foundation. Uh, I've been here about three and a half years now. Um, my work focuses primarily on um, the study and prevention of mass violence attacks, mm -hmm. as well as uh, school safety um, and, and prevention of um, and, and studying um, attacks on schools that have either been prevented or completed um, for the purposes of enhancing um, school safety and, and protecting our children. Mm -hmm. So that's a nutshell version of I guess about 36, 37 years in my career. Yes, that's quite a lot. Um, so something that you and I have in common is uh, uh, going to uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice for a forensic psychology master's program. Uh, and you have recently had an interest in applied behavior analysis. Is that right? That's correct. I actually... Um... I'm officially enrolled in the Florida Institute for Technology's uh, BCBA program, and I'll start my first course on uh, July 8th. Very good. I, I suppose you could say uh, for you, education really is a lifelong process. Yeah, very definitely. Um, you know, even when I wasn't pursuing a degree per se, um, I've been involved in various management training programs and crisis management training programs. Um, I'm a voracious reader, um, and, I, and I just think that it's critically important to continue to learn and to identify opportunities to bring learning into our into our professional lives and our personal lives. Mm -hmm. Would you say that uh, at, at this point in history, law enforcement is is depending uh, on uh, technology and particularly techn understanding of human behavior more than they ever have before? Yeah, I think we, you know, we're doing a lot of very interesting and important work um, with technology. Um, you know, the stuff we see every day, you know, police officers with body cameras or in-car cameras, um, but we're also doing a lot in terms of predictive analysis of crime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really trying to get ahead of crime based on pattern and trend analysis before uh, it occurs. Right. Um, so that that whole prevention piece. Um, my work in particular now um, focusing on school violence and trying to prevent school violence is very much focused on um, human behavior, right? Um, and I think that, in many ways, is what led me to be, to be curious about um, ABA, um, in addition to the fact that we have a, uh, a child who, who is autistic. Mm -hmm. That's probably where the, the interest started, is, is trying to find out about ABA as a potential therapy for our daughter, um, but then that 
led me to look deeper into it and to start to think about um, whether ABA could be applied in the area of, of school safety. Um, and I think there's a bunch of different places that, that ABA has application potentially in the school safety realm. That that is a very interesting tie-in to a. I didn't know that. That's a uh, has is your daughter receiving uh, services uh, in some way with ABA? Um, she isn't um, right now. We actually um, she's high functioning, mm -hmm. um, and so we went through the loop right now of neurofeedback, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to see how that goes, um, and we probably. We'll introduce some, I guess I would call it EBA white right. um, interventions to her probably in the fall through the, the school um, district. She's five, so um, she was in a pre-K um, class, and, and now when she goes back, she'll be in kindergarten, so we'll be able to um, work with the school district to, to get her connected to some, some EBA-type services. Very good. Um, in a recent, uh, yeah, it, it's so much I think ABA could be applied to. Um, you recently had uh, an article, 2019 study on 51 attacks averted, 51 school attacks averted, 51 completed. What can you tell us about that study? So, what we did is um, myself and a um, psychologist um, based in Pennsylvania by the name of Peter Langman, who studied for many years school shooters, um, looked at a database that we have at the National Police Foundation. It's, it's the Ability to Violence Database. It's funded by the U.S. Department of Justice um, Office of Community Oriented Policing. And the purpose of this database is to record incidents of attempted attacks, planned attacks um, that were not brought to fruition, um, and completed attacks. But the emphasis is really on those avoided attacks, trying to figure out what stopped them from happening. And so we did this analysis where we looked at 51 attacks that had been averted and 51 um, acts that had been completed to try to flesh out um, how they were stopped. Um, and what we found is that in the vast majority of cases that were averted, um, peers of, of the students um, or the potential attackers, typically students, um, became aware of the threat and brought that, um, that information forward to um, teachers and, and staff at schools. Uh, we find that most of the attacks, particularly those that take place in high schools, middle schools, high schools, and colleges, are uh, perpetrated by current or former students. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that that's incredibly important because that suggests real potential for prevention of those attacks. Um, we also find some interesting things when we look at um, either the attackers, the completed events, or the potential attackers, where we see that in, in most instances, those individuals um, exhibited behavior, um, exhibited communications that may have um, suggested to persons who, who were observant and um, around these individuals that something was wrong. Um, and, and that you know there was a potential performance for for to either self or, or to others. Um, when those warning signs were noticed, the attacks were prevented. Mm -hmm. um, when people in some cases didn't pay attention or reported them and they weren't followed up on, um, unfortunately we see the completed attacks. But you know, thinking about this in terms of the application or potential application of, of ABA um, in, in starting some of the reading for the class I'm going to be taking, I uh, found in the Cooper Heron um, book on applied behavioral analysis this this quote that says that the repertoire of behaviors each person brings to a situation has been selected, shaped, and maintained 
by his or her unique history of reinforcement. And I think that that, that quote is particularly important mm-hmm. um, because what we see in the potential attackers or, or the individuals that, that have completed an attack is this pattern of learned behavior that is either reinforced um, sometimes through connections to the internet, um, connections to um, books or other materials about prior attacks or or prior shooters, um, terms that are either absent or abusive, um, colleagues that, that reinforce and support aberrant behavior. And we see that probably the biggest barrier um, to school violence are safe, um, supportive, normative learning environments that foster a positive school environment that um, look at each student as unique individuals that work towards having students achieve success, both academically and and in their lives, um, that have um, positive role models for um, students to um, speak with, to to learn from. And um, having this culture in the school that is about positive support, Supports. It's about success. It's about identifying individuals who may have a life crisis that, that may start to withdraw from the group. Um, that if we can connect to those individuals pre-crisis and, and way upstream before crisis is even something on anybody's radar, um, we have a real opportunity to, to intervene and prevent acts of violence in, in school settings particularly these mass violence events and these rampage attacks. Um, and so I think, you know, that's where I see one of the one of the nexus, and, and there's a whole bunch of nexus, I think, law enforcement and criminal justice for ABA, but certainly in school environments, um, I think that, that whole idea of um, reinforcement of behavior and reinforcement of positive behavior and successful behavior is so critically important. In a in a 2018, uh, in an earlier report from, uh, let's see, National Police, from your National Police Foundation, it uh, listed, uh, it referred to this uh, upcoming um, study of the 51 attacks averted, 51 completed. It had lessons learned regarding uh, averted and completed school violence incidents. And one of them was establish relationships. Is that kind of what you're referring to as far as uh, knowing the students that could provide information uh, that a school attack is coming and it could be averted? How does establishing relationships fit in with with uh, this particular study? So I think it's relationships from a couple of different perspectives. One is trusting relationships that students believe uh, that they can go to school staff or to their teachers and report um, troubling behavior or concerning behavior uh, among their peers, and that if that report is made, um, that the school officials will take action to intervene um, and potentially, hopefully, help. Um, that person who's been identified or those persons that have been identified. And again, hopefully way upstream before somebody is in crisis. I think the other piece is, um, and we see this when we look at um, the ACE studies, right? The, um, the studies of adverse childhood experiences that one of the ways to help reprogram um, the, the brain, right, um, in, in a positive way is to have um, individuals, particularly young people, that have these 
adverse experiences in their lives, um, be attached to at least one adult role model. Um, and so, again, with this, this study, um, is we see those relationships as positive role modeling, um, attachment of um, students to someone who can help them, guide them, give them um, examples of positive um, you know, um, relationships with, with other people um, and encourage them academically and professionally to be successful. Uh, also, in that earlier report, because uh, we'd mentioned, encourage students to report threats and take threats seriously. What, what is your response to that? So, after 9-11, one of the campaigns that was born was the See Something, Say Something uh, campaign. I have added a, a third component to that is See Something, Say Something, Do Something. Mm -hmm. And so we want to encourage students and, and parents and neighbors and teachers and staff members that if they see troubling behavior, if they see concerning behavior, that they report it, um, that they report it to a child's parents, that they report it to school officials, that if it's extreme, they report it um, to law enforcement. By reporting it, we create the opportunity for intervention. Once that information has been received now, um, it becomes incumbent that the person to whom it's been reported to do something, and hence the third piece of it. Um, we see in several instances, one of which was the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting, where various individuals were aware of challenging, troubling behavior on the part of the, the person who perpetrated the attack um, and, and didn't follow up um, or didn't follow up as aggressively as, as they could have. So we believe that it's very important that if persons see troubling, concerning behavior, that they report it, that they do something um, with that, that they say something, and that the persons to whom that, that troubling, concerning behavior is reported to um, take actions uh, to, to intervene. Uh, another on here was monitor social media. That's a, that would be a one for our modern age. What do you, what's your response to that? What can you tell us about that? So we work with an organization, um, Bark, um, they're based in Atlanta. They're a social media, um, company and they have contracted with a number of school districts, um, across the country. Uh, whereby they monitor uh, the social media of the students in a given school district. They have been incredibly successful by all accounts, not just in terms of preventing the school mass violence attack or the rampage attack, but also identifying um, students that are having um, suicidal um, ideology um, that, that are involved in other um, harmful behaviors um, and getting that information to parents and to school officials so the proper interventions can be uh, can be taken. So we believe um, that as more and more of us are on social media every day and we use social media as um, in some cases our primary means of communication, um, that having an entity that has the consent and the permission to monitor that media creates another opportunity for, for intervention and for helping persons in need. Well, what suggestions do you have for uh, not social media, but uh, national media news organizations regarding their coverage of school attacks? Well, it's one thing that's happening and, and, and um, it is very good that it, that it has happened and continues to uh, move forward is to not speak about the identity of, of the individual or individuals that were involved or, or were contemplating an attack. So now what we typically see is 
one acknowledgement of, yes, this was the person or persons who were going to or did perpetrate the attack, and then their names disappear from the conversation. Um, their photographs disappear from the conversation, um, and the focus then becomes on the victims and the survivors uh, and, and moving forward and healing from the event. We feel that that's an incredibly important um, thing that, that the media is doing. Um, we don't want to dwell on the person that's inflicted such incredible pain on person's lives and give them uh, any attention, uh, whether we want to focus on the victims and the survivors and the healing process. So instead of making the perpetrators into notorious uh, celebrities, the focus becomes uh, more on the victims and the survivors. Exactly. We don't want the perpetrators to be in any way, shape, or form even identified with the word celebrity. Uh, um, and I was going to ask the benefits of focusing on uh, the survivors uh, in a webinar, recent webinar that you were involved in, uh, Christina Anderson, a uh, survivor yeah. of the Virginia Tech massacre. Uh, she seemed to have uh, some really good uh, comments to say, served as, an, uh, I think, an excellent example of uh, why we should focus on the survivors of such attacks. Yeah, Christina is an absolutely amazing person. Um, I had never met her until a week ago, two weeks ago now, um, when we were at a meeting in Washington together, um, and she just is absolutely amazing. She's full of so much um, joy, of a commitment to um, really prevent future acts, to um, help schools and, and, and education communities more broadly, to develop positive and supportive learning environments, uh, to get interventions to, to persons um, in need of services. Um, just absolutely an amazing person. Yeah, I was, I was really impressed by that webinar and her and your statements uh, in, the, in that recent webinar I found. Can you uh, tell us about, there's a program called, and I didn't put the full uh, statement, it's called CRASE, C-R-A-S-E. Are you familiar with that? Um, I know that that's, uh, I'm, I'm not, to, to, um, wouldn't, wouldn't see an acronym stand for? I didn't put it down as, uh, Grace, it, I, I think it's something to the effect of, uh, of getting information out about how to, uh, prevent, uh, violence. I, I may look that up here in a minute, but, uh, just to say, I've, just aside from that, um, uh, is there an issue of um, operational definition, since we're talking about the study of school attacks, is there an issue of, uh, of like how, how we define a school attack, for example, if there is a, a gang-related shooting or there is a, a, a you know, part of, a, a, of another type of crime spree, or can we effectively oper operationally define school attacks for a study like this? And how did you handle that problem? Yeah, so um, I did find a place, so we can go back to that at that time. So in our um, report, a completed attack for us is a uh, violent attack completed literally without the use of a firearm that took place on school grounds and resulted in any injury or loss of life. Um, we typically don't, well, not typically, we don't include um, acts of gang violence. We don't include um, relational attacks. Our study, our focus is really on mass violence events or attempted or planned mass violence events where you have multiple 
um, individuals as the intended victim or victims when it's which completed. Um, so, um, you know, and, it, and it's really an attack that's born out of a relationship to that school or to persons in that school. So it's, it's school, in, in the case of school violence, it's school-centric versus, you know, to settle a beef, if you will, um, that, that may have happened down the street or um, a drug deal or that type of thing. We're really looking for that and focusing on those mass violence attacks. There are a number of other databases out there that try to capture all instances of violence on school property or in the vicinity of school property. And those databases... Um, would include the, the gang shootings or drug shootings or relational uh, attacks. Um, we think that there are unique pieces to the mass violence attack, um, to the psychology of the, of the mass violence offender, um, typically in that there's a plan. It's something that is um, thought about over time that, um, there's weapons ac um, acquisitions to, to accomplish it. Um, the focus of the attack is not typically to settle an argument or control over a territory. Um, there, there are often mental health issues mm -hmm. uh, involved, not necessarily that the mental health issues drive the attack, um, but, but the person is challenged by um, life events um, by uh, mental or physical illness. Um, <clears throat> and so we see this, this separation, if you will, in terms of mass violence attacks, rampage attacks from, um, I don't know, I don't know, from other instances of, of violence in and around school campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see a distinction between the school attacks and other mass shootings, like so you had done work on the San Bernardino shooting, and uh, there's been numerous ones that uh, are just well known of, not of school attacks, but of uh, attacks uh, just out in the community. Um, do you see any distinctions among school attacks, or are they very similar to the mass shootings that we would see in other settings? I think school attacks are probably closer to maybe a workplace violence, attack in that the person perpetrating um, the attack is either currently, and we just saw this sadly in Virginia Beach, um, currently um, an employee of the organization um, or as a, as a former employee, so current student, former student, um, suggesting maybe a greater ability to detect um, and, and avert an attack uh, by identifying individuals in need of intervention, in need of help, in need of support, um, versus a random attack like we saw in Kalamazoo where an individual um, randomly picked out targets on the street and, and shot um, and, and, and in some cases killed innocent people that he had no relationship with before. Um, you know, people outside of a restaurant, um, people outside of an apartment building. Um, those type of attacks, those, those random uh, attacks are, are obviously much more difficult to identify the potential perpetrator um, as well as to uh, in those attacks and, and stop them. Do you think that the uh, Columbine, I think that was in 1999, do you think the Columbine shooting, uh, based on what we know, do you think that could have been prevented? I, I think that there, there may have been opportunities for intervention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard to say that it could have been prevented. Um, and that's why I, I use the term there were opportunities for intervention. Mm -hmm. But we see even when people 
um, receive services and 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 have um, been afforded interventions in some cases, um, they still continue forward and, and commit these horrendous acts, right? Marjorie Stoneman Douglas would be a very good example of that, where the shooter had multiple contacts over multiple years, almost really their whole life, um, with mental health services, um, but still went on to commit, you know, this extraordinarily um, violent and, and horrific attack on the school. Um, so I think, yes, there were opportunities for intervention. Would it have stopped the attack? You know, we don't know. We'll never know. Right. So you, you did ask me about um, class, mm-hmm. and um, it is civilian training for um, active shooter events. Um, and it, it talks about building skills on avoiding, denying, defending um, in these type of events. I think that it is incredibly important that all of us, um, without paranoia, are aware of the possibility that these events can and do occur any time in any community in any place. I think it is very appropriate for persons to be aware of their surroundings, um, to be aware of where the um, AED machine is, um, where maybe trauma kits or first aid kits are located, um, when they're in a store, when they're in a church, when they're in a movie theater. Um, they're aware of uh, exits. I think the Stop the Bleed campaign um, is an incredibly important campaign where we teach civilians um, basic life skill uh, saving skills in terms of applying tourniquets and um, bandaging uh, individuals that, that may have um, suffered um, a serious injury. Uh, just like CPR and uh, and those techniques are incredibly important. So I think training civilians to to be aware of their surroundings, um, knowing what to do um, if God forbid um, an emergency a, a crisis starts to unfold. Um, we've done that for years and years around tornadoes and hurricanes and. Um, those those type of events, those natural events, particularly in areas of the country um, that they occur uh, frequently. Um, I think we need to also, um, as part of an all-hazards approach, um, raise the level of awareness um, through programs like, like CRAS, through Stop the Bleed, um, One High Fight, um, type campaigns so that there is a greater awareness uh, among uh, the civilian population in terms of how to respond. And we see now with greater frequency um, individual community members taking actions to stop um, or to attempt to intervene um, in, in these, these mass violence events. Mm-hmm. Does that kind of go along with it? I hear the term situational awareness um, now and then. That kind of goes along with that theme, do you think? Absolutely, right. Um, we, we Just like when we're driving our cars, um, we, we want to be aware of what's happening around us, right? Who's stopping short, who's turning left, who's turning right, what the traffic signals are doing, um, what's happening with our car in terms of its mechanics. Um, we want to have that situational awareness when we go to the movie theaters, when we go to a restaurant, uh, when we want to, when we go to church, when we go to the mall. We want to be aware of our surroundings and what's happening in our surroundings and how we're going to react potentially if something starts to, to become a problem. And what about the benefits of uh, school resource officers or other forms of security for the school? Is that, uh, do you see any changes that need to be made there? Or what, what should we know about that part of the equation of keeping people safe in schools? 
Yeah, I, I think that school resource officers are an invaluable um, asset. And I think an invaluable asset in terms of the physical protection of students and, and faculty and staff, as well as the physical plant. I also think that a well-trained and well-equipped school resource officer um, really has the ability to be that positive role model. I think through crisis intervention training has the ability, ability to um, identify students in need of, of um, assistance, or in need of intervention, in need of services, um, has the ability to um, head off problems before they, they build, um, to really see those um, potential challenges um, developing and, and get a student and, and potentially their family connected. Um, they certainly have a law enforcement role to play in terms of uh, drug interdiction, uh, in terms of gang interdiction in schools. But I really see school resource officers and, and school security personnel um, as being, again, that positive adult role model who has the ability um, to, to help students succeed in educational environments. The, the positive reinforcement becomes critical in this. Absolutely. 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 Uh, it seems like uh, for school shootings, yeah, yeah, we've talked about situational awareness, but the the element of surprise is so. Uh, if we could find a way to overcome that or eliminate it, it seems like the element of surprise is really a part of. I don't know the not necessarily the motive, but really a, a an attractive part for the attacker is to have that element of surprise. And that our own unaware are are becoming more aware on what the resources are in advance would in turn become critical in preventing the attacks. Yeah, I, I, I think absolutely knowing what resources are available ahead of time is, is critically important. Yeah. And again, that normative positive school learning environment that's safe and supportive of students. Um, having um, schools that um, are set up in a manner that, that screen visitors to the school so that people can't just enter a school facility and, and, and have unfettered access, but they have to tie in somewhere and they have to be escorted within the school building, I think is, is critically important. Uh, having everybody on the school campus aware of what the emergency response plan is, what do you, what do, you do during a man-made or a natural disaster, um, how do you protect yourself, how do you protect your fellow students, how do you protect um, the school environment, I think is, is very, very important. I visited a elementary school recently, and then I, I found out I, I need to have my ID, and then when I've done, I was done doing the assessment, what I needed to do on the way back. People were asking, you know, who I was and what I was doing there, and I had my ID present from my job. So it, it just kind of indicated to me how much times have changed. I, I think when I was in school, people could just walk right in and go to the classroom, as I recall. Yeah, no, I think there's a much greater appreciation for the need to... Uh, to be secure uh -huh. um, and, and to be cognizant of who's in the school environment. Absolutely. Uh, I think this has been an extremely informative uh, discussion we've had, uh, I didn't, uh, uh, especially on, on this very, uh, very sensitive and timely issue. Is there anything else you'd want to add uh, on top of what we've talked about, Frank? No, um, I, I really appreciate um, your time, Tim, and, and asking me to, to spend some time with you and your audience. Um, it is a very, very important uh, topic, and, I, and 
Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak about our work and uh, opportunities to uh, to help our students and help our uh, educational uh, institutions be successful in, in positive learning environments. And we really appreciate you, Frank, learning as much as you have and studying as much as you have to uh, Im improve uh, and modernize uh, law enforcement. I, I'm really impressed by the work that you and, and what other people are doing. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate that. And, and hopefully, um, in the next endeavor, it'll give me additional skills to, to be able to contribute to the law enforcement community and to the school safety community. And I, I can already tell you've become familiar with behavior analysis because the Cooper book is like the Bible of uh, ABA people. Once uh, once you start talking about that, their their ears perk up. So. It's, 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 uh, it's been interesting so far. I uh, really enjoyed reading and, uh, and learning quite, quite a bit from it. And I'm really uh, very excited about getting in the program and um, several people talked about the Florida Institute of Technology program and, and recommended it to me. So um, for anybody who may be listening to this podcast in, in the future, um, thank you uh, for the advice and counsel that so many people gave me and encouraged me to, to go in this direction. podcast, as well as our Facebook page and other social media sites.